Coming up, submissions are now open for the Disney Parks Moms panel. Alcohol is coming to the public at Disneyland for the first time in its 60-year history. We discuss a permit file that could hint at a Hollywood Studios expansion. And in the main segment, we discuss everything you need to know about the Epcot International Food and Wine Festival. All that and more on this episode of WDW Opinion. Cue the music. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. This is the podcast where two friends, Connor. You are a child plaything. And Hank. You are a sad, strange little man. Can you have my pity? Share their opinions, tips, and stories about anything and everything at Walt Disney World. Trust me, what Get ready, because this is WDW Opinion. Or in the tower, we are ready for takeoff. Hello and welcome to episode number 10 of WDW Opinion, the podcast where friends talk Disney. Visit WDWOpinion.com to check out our blog posts on all things Disney and Universal, and follow us on social media at WDW Opinion to see what we're up to in between episodes. I'm your host, Connor Brown, and I'm joined by my co-host and Disney partner in crime, Mr. Hank Molsky. Hank, about half the country is swimming underwater this weekend from Tropical Storm Gordon as it makes its way across the Midwest. Hank, have you felt pressured to buy a $10 poncho from a souvenir shop this weekend? No, but I have been running from store to store, <laughs> hiding under cover as it pours rain. I do love the, um, anytime it rains at Disney, you know, that is a big thing. The ponchos oh. come out, oh, but they it's hilarious out. because they're all in all of the stores. They're just under the cashier's desk. <laughs> and as soon as like one, dr- one drop is out, just bloop, ponchos magically appear. Yep. You know what? It's almost not even. It's not even when it rains. It's the the two p.m. shower. Yes. Put the, put the yeah, ponchos yeah. out. Put the ponchos out. It's about to rain. It's about to rain. Put the ponchos out. <laughs> Why? They just about to they, rain because it's it's two o'clock. There is something about the thrill of that watching people run th- in in those downpours and you're hiding undercover. I don't know. I, and then you 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 are the person that runs from cover to cover. Sometimes it's just that magical mix of people, you know, trying to get the most out of their. $120 they spent to get into the park. I do feel bad for uh, the cast members at times because people just like will hide out in a in a store. And last time I was there, <laughs> it was monsooning. And we were in Memento Mori, which is the gift shop for Haunted Mansion. And it's very small. And yeah, very small. And it's packed to the gills. And the cast members were just sitting over there like, yeah, this happens all the time. But it's also the, that covered bridge there that goes from Liberty Square to Fantasyland yeah. right, right before the bottleneck, and everyone was just under it. I mean, there had to have been like 150 people under this. Listening to your story, it just makes you think everyone, it seems like any you know, casual to moderate to very high Disney goer, if you've had a repeat visit there, you've got your story of like thinking about a specific uh, gift shop that you've stopped in to stay oh, dry. Yeah. Everyone's oh, got I, that story. Yes. I'm thinking Absolutely. of Splash Mountain. I'm thinking of... I mean, they're, they're anywhere. Up Main Street, trying to stay dry. Everyone's got that story where you're like, oh, yep, dove in there. Dove in the old Christmas shop. Spent an hour in there while it poured. Um, we, uh, like on our first time visiting the park on my college program, it poured. And after that day, one of my roommates brought an umbrella with him at all times. Like oh he did gosh. not have an umbrella with him. It was great. Well, yeah, we bought ponchos for my last trip, and if you buy the ponchos at home, you know, of course, it it will not rain Mm-mm. there. No, no. Only no. when you only when you forget them. Only when you forget everything. Yes. Yes, yeah. indeed. We should probably also point out this is our tenth episode. Hey, we made it to the big leagues, and that's gonna do it from us. That's, that's uh, <laughs> signing off. It was a good run. <laughs> signing off. No, we will give you more. Uh, unfortunately, probably, but um. With all that said, let's get into the show. It's time for News to Opinion. This is our weekly segment where we each pick a Disney news story from the past week to discuss and share our thoughts and opinions on. My Disney news story this week is the 12th annual Disney Parks Moms panel search has begun. Each year, 
Real, everyday guests are hand-chosen from all around the globe to join the Disney Parks Moms panel, an online resource for vacation planners to seek honest and relatable Disney vacation tips from like-minded travelers. The panelists are your next-door neighbors, your good friends, and above all else, seasoned Disney vacationers you can count on for heartfelt advice when planning your next trip to a Disney destination. If you're interested in becoming a part of the magic, applications for the 2019 panel are currently open and they will close at noon Eastern on Wednesday, September 12th, 2018. So you only got a couple days to apply. The reason I'm bringing this up is the quote unquote moms that make Mm -hmm. up this panel. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a mom. That's right. I, Connor Brown, a man who's 25 with no children have applied for the Disney Parks Moms panel. Oh. Wish me luck. Congrats. No children. No children. (laughs) Who knows by the end of it? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. That's Uh, fantastic. This is a really cool thing that they do. It's You basically can just Google Disney Parks Moms panel, uh, and it'll pop up. And it's like an online forum, and it's real people that put in their applications who have been to Disney Parks, you know, time and time again. And, um... I don't know if they're paid for their efforts, but they basically get a free Disney vacation um, for them and a certain number of guests, Disneyland or Disney World. They go down once they're picked, and they do like a week's worth of training or something, Um, and then basically they just answer questions on the mom's panel. So it's good. It's basically like Disney Yelp. Obviously, it's skewed because all these people love Disney. But it's more in the planning process. Like, what about this? What about this? Well, what if I should do this? And it's cool to get that feedback. And, I mean, it's a great thing that Disney does. Connor, do they, is it heavily, like, tilted towards moms? Or is it is it a pretty diverse group of people from, like, gender and family type? Um, I mean, it, it varies from... from year to year i know when it first started it was basically just moms you know yeah but the reason behind that was i think they thought moms were the the chief um vacation planners when it came to disney in the household oh okay so now it's just like a legacy name that's yeah. stuck around yeah it, absolutely um and we're two we're the two sad saps in our families that yeah do we're that the t- we're the we're the two sad moms Ooh. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> well there we go Tie your shoes. New name change for the show. Yeah. Two sad moms. Two sad. That's pretty good. These are boys leave some, <laughs> with no children. Leave Ooh. some comments on um, on our Facebook or Twitter account and let us know if you want us to change our podcast name to Two Sad Moms. Two Sad Moms. Hashtag Two Sad Moms. Well, wish me luck because, um, God, wouldn't that be incredible if I was on the Disney Parks Moms panel? Oh, yeah. It'd be, it'd be fantastic. Then all of our listeners out there that are tuning in already can say they knew you before you got your big break. My big break. Well, I always say that. I, I already board. tell people that. I say, hey, I know that guy before before he even started the podcast. You do. Oh. That's nice. Well, there you go. Put in your applications before they close. Hank, what's your news story of the week? Connor, my news uh, story of the week, news to opinion, is... Olga's Cantina coming to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge in 2019. This is from the um, Disney Parks blog for uh, Disneyland Resort. Connor, the reason that this story has made massive waves all the way up to the largest publications across the country, you and I have talked about it this week. Plenty of podcasts have probably noted this out as well, but we wanted to put our opinion in on it. Um, We're going to cherry pick one line out of this news release that everyone is gravitating towards. And that one sentence is, Patrons of the cantina come across the galaxy to sample the famous concoctions created with exotic ingredients using otherworldly methods served in unique vessels. With choices for kids and libations for adults, the cantina will make for a great stop. Connor, the Disney world and pretty much the media reporting world as a whole has noted, centered in onto that sentence and said, that's it. Alcohol has made its way in to the Disneyland Resort. 
parks in California, which will be the mark the first time officially that they have served alcohol in the parks. Connor, um, in Disneyland. In Disneyland, yeah, I should say in yeah. Disneyland. Um, lots of opinions floating around out there. I don't, I, I don't want to say it's a negative backlash, but there's certainly you know naysayers out there. I think a net positive. People are excited for this type of thing. But we are dancing into this territory of, is this something that Walt would want? Um, One of those questions that comes up every every time that there's a change to the park. And this one is an even bigger moment for Disney because it is something that's a bit more controversial than just adding a ride. Adding alcohol to a park and something that's been the same since the day the park's gates opened. Um, Personally, we'll kick off a little round of... Uh, a back and forth opinion here, but I would say I'm excited. It is only in the cantina. It's not going to be that big of a difference, but we'll talk more than just that opinion. So I think this has definitely been a long time coming. I understand, you know, the reasoning behind it. Yes. Walt said there will, there will not, there's not going to be alcohol served in the, uh, in Disneyland. It's going to be a family place. That idea stuck um, in Florida until Epcot opened, but um, I think it's just people freaking out because they think he would have wanted it some other way, even though he's been passed away for 40 some odd years. Correct. Um, I mean, times change. Like, that's the big thing. Hank and I were talking about this. When Disneyland opened, there was a tobacco store on Main Street. Like, you would walk in and you'd go to the tobacco (laughs) store and get your cigarettes before you headed fully into the park. Um, There was a good... um, And and everyone who's, woe is me, oh, God, this this is devastating. This is awful. I thought this was supposed to be a family place. It is a family place. Mm -hmm. But you know who goes a lot? Single people. (laughs) <laughs> like 20 somethings with no children soon to be parks mom's panels yeah there no you go. children two sad moms. moms um and you know we saw this a few years back when um be our guest opened magic kingdom was the same way no alcohol in it they started serving alcohol at um dinner time there to fit in with the motif of you know it's a French restaurant or whatever, but right now it's expanded to every sit-down restaurant in Magic Kingdom. Yep. Who knows if it will ever get to um, um, kiosks and walk-up kiosks in the parks. I don't think so, at least not for a, a long time. I have no problems with it, but there it, it is telling when the line is libations for adults, and that's yeah. the only line in this, you know... 10 paragraph post that Disney put. They knew they were going to get some 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 backlash. Yeah. And so, so here's my thing. You know, there's there's obviously the the times change which I certainly agree with. I mean, we're talking, you know, you could buy tobacco on Main Street. Men weren't allowed to have a beard at all. Of course, you know, you know, C-suite executives can have a beard or a mustache now or <laughs> I shouldn't say mustache cuz Walt did. But, you know, you can have a beard and be a respectable member of society. They just didn't want people looking like gypsies like at a carnival when Disneyland opened up. Um, so, you know, it's obviously much different now in that aspect. But for me, I'm going to focus... A, a thing that I think is interesting about it is it's so highly themed at this point where it's not like these people are walking around with a Bud Light can. They're walking <laughs> around... You know, it's like these drinks from Pandora, essentially, that look nothing like an alcoholic beverage. I mean, maybe. You know what I mean? It, it's not like they're... It, truly, they're not walking around with something that looks like an oversized margarita. It's not something that looks like, you know, a tall boy. It's It fits in with the world. It's It's something that you'd almost feel maybe disconnected like you wouldn't be going to the right type of cantina if they weren't serving you something that was a bit alcoholic um i just i I think it in that way and the same way that you put it it's like it's at a sit-down restaurant you're not you know walking around with alcohol alcoholic beverages in magic kingdom um well this isn't going to be sit down but it's going to be 
a dedicated right. space. Correct. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. like Pongu Pongu in yes. Animal Kingdom or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So like either you're walking around the park with something that's not looking like alcohol ish. Or you're sitting down and you're experiencing a meal where you're served alcohol at one of these parks that's usually prohibitive of the alcohol-looking experience. So uh, that's my I th- thought. I think it's it's also interesting just because, you know, they've singled out these two parks, Disneyland and Magic Kingdom, like, oh, well, it's just it's, – it's a family place. It's a family place. All those families are also going to Animal <laughs> yeah, Kingdom, right. Hollywood Studios, yeah. and Epcot and California Adventure. And they all have have alcohol. You know, I think the the argument that, oh, well, it's sad that there isn't a place where, you know, a family isn't, doesn't have to be surrounded by alcohol. And you're like, well, isn't that, like, everywhere? If you're, if you're really worried about that, your kids are just going to live in the basement and not go out of the house. Like, you can't right. go anywhere and, and not You might as well go to a place where they're not walking around with, you know, tall boys. You take them to a sporting event. Don't, go to, all... a, don't go to an Olive Garden or Red Robin. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. It, our, it's... our sponsor this week, Red Robin. Yum. <laughs> um, I, we, Hank and I were talking about this. Um, a guy that we – is a YouTuber. His name's Rob Plays. He had a couple good points, but he mentioned this in a tweet. He said, of all the arguments I've seen this week – for and against serving alcohol at Disneyland. The one that boggles my mind most is that it shouldn't be sold because you don't need alcohol to enjoy Disney. I don't get that logic. We don't need ice cream to enjoy Disney either. Do we ban that? You know, it's one of those things where it's like, who are you to say that person shouldn't have it because that's your opinion, you know? Yeah. It, It is what it is. I mean... No one's you know, even, people, you don't need Small World to enjoy yeah, Disney World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. should just burn it down. You don't need Stitch's Great Escape to <laughs> enjoy <laughs> Disney World, but we're happy it's there. <laughs> yeah. You it is interesting. Need... Hey, I'll tell you this much. It's going to be awesome. Um, Oga's Cantina. Um, yeah, it's going to be sweet. It'll be at both Disneyland and... Um, Hollywood Studios when Black Spire Outpost opens, and yeah. uh, we'll link the article in the in the show notes so that you can see the artist renderings and get a couple more details that they have. But there you have it. Connor will become a Disney Parks mom panelist, and alcohol is coming to Disneyland. Are those two correlated? Maybe. 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 For our middle segment this week, I want to discuss a rumor I read about from a reputable source. WDW Info is reporting that additional theming may be added to a Hollywood Studios attraction soon. A permit filed could imply that additional theming is in store for an attraction adjacent adjacent to Stage Lane in Disney's Hollywood Studios. Although there are a few possibilities based on the address of the project and the contractor involved, it currently appears that an attraction in Toy Story Land might already be adding onto its ride and queue theming. A permit describes scenes 5, 7, and queue installation as the areas where work will commence on the property. These notices expire one year after filing unless another date is noted, which is not the case here, and these are usually posted shortly before work begins. This article is directly from WDW Info, and they also talk about the contractor involved, which is Mad Creative Fabrication, LLC. It's a company based out of Orlando, and it specializes in custom fabrications and art installations. Much of their previous work seems smaller, but the nature of this company suggests theming, whether on Slinky Dog or another attraction, would not be a large-scale endeavor and will likely not affect the location's operation to a significant degree. Now, this is... Um, a rumor, for sure, and they also touch on Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, like maybe it has something to do with that, or Toy Story Mania, but when you look at where it was filed, and I don't know what this means, just because I don't know how addresses work backstage, um, it is basically like directly next to Slinky Dog Dash, so... For this rumor and for someone who's been to 
Toy Story Land, Hank. Did you feel like there was a lack of of theming in this in this area? So okay, now I I looked at the map on this thing, and I gotta admit, I am just as confused as anything on this. It almost doesn't really make sense where it what they would need this for. Plus, okay, Connor and I have talked about this in the past. What's the one thing that that area of the park needs? Shade. This isn't going to help with that. Unless it's over the queue, which already is mostly shaded. And that's what I, I don't understand. understand. I don't know, because it seems like where it's located is the other side of where the queue is, right? Exactly. That's what it yeah. is. And yeah. we've already talked about how uh, this isn't for an Al's Toy Barn. It's, unless it's, unless this is the this company's getting their big break, but I wish I could offer more. I mean, like there's parts of that ride that you just move too quick on it to feel like there really needs to be a lot more theming. Unless are they could they try to be are they attempting to obscure the skyline from like how much of uh, Star Wars you're able to see? I don't know because again, it's it's the opposite direction. Gosh, you're right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a I lot of space back there. I will say that there's a lot of space back behind, like where the the entrance yeah. is, oh, where yeah. Woody is. Um, it, it, but it doesn't feel under themed. Let me let me no. put it that way. The, to answer your question, it does not feel under themed in that area. It's an inaccessible part that your interaction with is extremely limited. So it's interesting. You know, we talked about it. On a previous episode, I believe it's episode two of Toy Story Land, about like what happened to it and things like that. A lot of budget cuts that it had, and specifically theming to Slinky Dog Dash. Could this be adding in more characters um, as you go through the ride, more scenes as you go through the ride? Um, who knows? These permits are always interesting because it's kind of basically it's it's a gigantic puzzle that you have like the final piece you don't have the final piece but you have the middle piece and you have to figure out the first piece and the last piece for that like beginning middle and end story um correct it's interesting i think it's just something to keep your eye on um yeah i think and then I, maybe the other thing that we shouldn't rule out also is any type of shade installation. If you look at what that area needs, if you look at what's going on in that park, if you look at um, how self-contained... So let me let me step back. Let's look first at Star Wars Land. Probably not going to have to do anything with that. It's on the opposite side of Toy Story Land. Probably unrelated to that, even though that this company has worked with Star Wars Land in the past. That area is going to be totally self-contained. It's a totally immersive space. That type of deal... Then you look at Mickey's Runaway Railway, which is the retheming of the Chinese theater for a new ride that will likely be opening in 2019 next year um, to help with the crowds in that park, mostly. Um, that's right in the center, like right when you come up the main street when you come into the park. Um, a lot of that ride will be self-contained. It's a big space for a big ride, a lot of indoor queue space, a lot of queue space in the front. So anything behind that would probably be unaffected. Which mm -hmm. leaves you with Toy Story Land, which is what it's right next to. And it's where a lot of the areas of this permit are filed. And if you look at what that park opened to, you know, m moderate success, maybe a little bit underwhelming for Disney. And you look at what they're actually capable of changing. Not going to add a gift shop, probably. They don't need any more theming in that area. They need shade. So if you think about like well, how that could affect the shade of that park, maybe it's some type of contraption that's going to be strung across. Like, you know, maybe it's Andy, you know, hanging up like socks drying across the backyard or some type of thing to make it look a little bit more immersive in the way that they're covering pathways. Like yeah. it could be like giant pencils or pens stuck in the ground back over in that area that then drape all the way across. And that's where the big construction starts. That's kind of what I think now when I think the whole thing through. Because I, there's such a limited amount of things that they need to do to that park right now. I mean, a lot of stuff that needs to go on. So it's like they only need to add critical changes. They're not going to add another Jesse doll or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's not going to be the getting people in, you know. 
Right. I think it's going to right. it's more how do we uh, make them happy while they're here? You know, lessen the inconveniences that are occurring. Um, it's very interesting. I just wanted to talk to it, talk about it today on the show. We'll keep you updated if we hear anything else on this front as well. As summer comes to a close, fall begins to descend upon the Walt Disney World Resort. Halloween festivities and fall decorations grace the parks, and it has become a season worth going out of your way to experience. And for the past 23 years, fall has also become synonymous with one of Walt Disney World's most popular events. The Epcot International Food and Wine Festival. The festival brings close to 35 global marketplace food kiosks to the theme park, each themed to a different country or culinary topic. Offering snack-sized portions, the festival is a great way to sample a variety of incredible food options throughout the park. In an already gourmet heavy theme park such as Epcot, the Food and Wine Festival puts it over the top. This week we wanted to share our tips and strategies for getting the most out of food and wine while also telling you about the key offerings the festival has. We'll be noshing our way through Epcot today on WDW Opinion. Hank, what's your favorite part about food and wine? Hmm, man. I think it's just the expansion of uh, the international promenade. Mm-hmm. I always I see, okay, I get this messed up because the international gateway at Paramount's Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio is called the International Promenade. Oh, like the, it's like the Main Street, right? Yeah, what yeah. and then so Epcot is international It's just the World Showcase. The World Showcase. There's no word international. And then it's International Food and Wine Festival. Yeah. There's all my combination. There Connor, I love the World Showcase filling out. I think that there's something about that that makes you feel you know, when they talk about adding countries, you're like, Man, it's pretty tight out there. I don't know how they could do that. But then you go for Food and Wine Festival, and you just feel how vibrant the whole thing is and how connected the whole space is, how excited people are to be there. There's people eating, dining. You don't feel like you're walking long distances to places. It just feels vibrant. That's what I love. That's what's cool about that park. Oh, I totally agree. I know we we talked about this on our Christmas in July episode, but anytime a, a new season or festivity comes to the parks, it's awesome just because it's like a new thing to experience. You yeah. see the parks in a different light. The Epcot International Food and Wine Festival is no exception. It it just breathes new life into the park. Um, and Epcot has become very festival focused in this regard. Um, yeah, no but kidding. it all started with the Food and Wine Festival um, 23 years ago. Yeah. I think it's really interesting, it, you know, while we're kicking off our food and wine segment, I, um, I was doing some research in preparation for today, and I came across a good anecdote that was, you know, Connor, that the summer movie season didn't exist prior to the release of Jaws mm-hmm. in 1975. That used to be the time of year where you, of like, movie studios avoided releasing film because there was too much going on in the summer. You didn't want to go to the, a movie in the summer because it's beautiful outside. Now, it's the the almost the pinnacle of the year for film studios. You know, early May into June, that's when you drop your blockbuster. And then it all kind of started with Jaws. And it's just times change. You find a new way to bring people into your theater. Much like the problem Disney was facing back um, before they had the Food and Wine Festival was this thought that, yeah, people want to go to Disney World in the summer. <laughs> I'm laughing because, you know, it's kids are off school. It's the time to bring your family here. And they needed to figure out a way to bring people into the park, specifically an underserved park that didn't have a lot of theming, uh, highly e-ticket attractions like Epcot. 
And the Food and Wine Festival was that kind of solution that maybe we can get people to start thinking about coming to Disney World during this type of year. So it's really cool now, 23 years later, to see how that's expanded just beyond 30 days. I mean, my God. (laughs) Yeah, I can't imagine it just being 30 days. People would lose their mind now. Um, But Disney is very good at looking at the calendar, saying no one's coming during these weeks. What should we do there? There's a reason why the weekend after New Year's, where everyone should be back at work, has become one of the most popular weekends in all of Disney World, and that's because they decided to put the marathon there. And the Walt Disney World (laughs) Marathon is now an insanely popular weekend. They're just very good about going in, seeing what days need attention and creating something truly incredible because that's what it comes down to if it was if it was something crappy people wouldn't go but because it's so massive and it's so awesome people make trips for it every single year um i know know we do it a lot um and what it's especially good for is locals as well it gets in locals um Mm -hmm. quite a bit just so that they can you know eat their way around Epcot on a Friday or Saturday, something like that. I think, yeah, if you just look at the calendar, I love the way that you put that, is if you just look at the calendar, you can do this quick too. You look at the times of years where they need attention, Disney's doing something there. You know, you look at January, boom, marathon. Uh, Shortly after that, February opens up, and that's when all the spring breakers start to roll in from colleges gets really crowded, much more expensive to travel there in late February, early March. And then when that dies down, before the summer season starts up, and after, you know, spring breakers, like, in you know, it rolls into uh, primary school and high school and that type of traveling spring break period, they've got the Flower and Garden Show now, which is, you know, for all intents and purposes, a clone shrunk down of the Food and Wine Festival. Then you got summer, they do a summer promotion, and then boom, you got food and wine festival all fall, uh, smashed between uh, a Halloween and a Christmas party. I mean, they've really got it all covered. Oh, yeah. There's not, there's no more slow season, unfortunately. There's slow weeks and things like that, mm-hmm. but there are no more slow seasons. This was definitely a slow week for Disney, if you watch crowd calendars. And oh, stuff. yes. Oh, absolutely. This right after Labor week. Day? Because yeah. um, when, when, do, uh, when do schools go back in Ohio? Uh, mostly, a lot of schools now are doing that thing where they're back uh, mid-August, but there's still a few that trickle back after Labor Day. Maryland just switched. We're all after Labor Day now. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. That's that's great. I was looking. Good, good for the kids. Good for the our, children. <laughs> oh gosh, it, it's our character. It's grumpy old man's back. I can't believe. Shouldn't uh, they be learning in <laughs> school? God Almighty! I saw our friends at Touring Plans uh, this week. We're tweeting out that um, the crowd calendar for Disney uh, this past week was a 1 out of 10. Oh. So on a scale of 1 to 10, it, it, it was open season in the parks. I think there were two other people you would go into the parks with. Yeah, but you know what? And here's the thing. And, and there are – I was looking at, at – like, granted, it was a Saturday. So last night I was looking at – God, we are sad. Last night on a <laughs> Saturday I was looking at ride times in Disney World. Um it was raining here. I wasn't doing anything. I'm sorry. It, don't, it don't, sounds like, no, uh, don't. There's no need for excuses. You did what you did. Okay. I did what I did. It was, it, there's still pretty long waits. You know, at like 10 o'clock, it was like a 60 minute wait for Spl- Space Mountain. Splash Mountain was 45 minutes. Mm. Like you said, Connor, there's no more slow season. No more slow seasons. But because of that, we do have awesome things to experience, like the Food and Wine Festival. Um, The main pull here, of course, is, as the name suggests, food and wine. Um, So I guess the best way to talk about this is, well, right now we'll focus on their global marketplaces. So these occur every certain number of feet, but basically they're little sort of pop-up stalls. Um, And they're in between the pavilions. Um, of the World Showcase. There's a couple in Future World as well, but it's mainly themed to either a culinary topic or a country. So a couple ones I'll just read off right now. Country-wise, they have ones like Australia, Belgium, Brazil, um, 
but then they also have ones that are also um, even though there's a pavilion there they have another food stall for it for it too which will serve unique things just um, for the festival oh, yeah. so like like there's not a Brazil pavilion um, there is a Brazil stall but even though there's a France pavilion they also have a France stall they have a Germany stall um, they have a China stall, Canada stall, and most of the time it's just um, foods unique to the the festival. Mm-hmm. But then on top of that, you also have a couple of booths themed to kind of like an idea. So um, one here is called Active Eats, and it's described as please your palate with these healthy, action-packed bites for All pure right. taste bud bliss. So that's probably focused on, like, healthy eating, stuff like that. Here's one, the Cheese Studio, hosted by Borsan Cheese. That sounds incredible. Earth Eats. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, that's over by the, uh, that little flowery garden area. Healthy, healthy fare. The Imagination Pavilion. Flavors from the fire. Ooh, add some heat to your Epicurean adventure with these spicy bites. I, I actually really am starting to like that. Like, that's what they should start doing. They should do, um, uh, oh, this is the heat booth. This is the, um, the Wait salt. Wait a minute. Salt Wait a booth. minute. I don't even knew, I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, I think this one's new for this year. Oh my uh, gosh. We'll get into to, to new ones, but flavors from the fire. Um, Light Lab is another one. That has a lot. They they're like playing with these, you know, drinks and concoctions and stuff. But um, yeah, they're all great. Uh, basically, what they offer is typically two to three, maybe sometimes four little entrees, quote unquote entrees. Most of the time, they'll offer a dessert, and then they'll also probably offer a couple selections of wines from that country or from that region or like a mixed beverage from that region a beer if it's applicable um and then every once in a while at certain stalls you'll see uh specialty drinks like whether they're alcoholic or not it might be like a certain smoothie or certain frozen drink something like that so these entrees are really more they're not bite size but you know they're, they take a few bites, and they're usually priced around the anywhere from four to eight dollars. Yeah, that's I would fantastic, say. and that's another thing that like you gotta you gotta stress to people that I don't know, haven't been to a food and wine festival or thinking about going or are nervous about the pricing. It is especially for locals. I'm sure we have plenty of locals that listen to this show. It is an absolutely no brainer to go and, as you said, nosh on some of these moderately priced things that you get a pretty healthy serving size for like four to eight dollars going to like a taste of a city like a taste of for me cincinnati or a taste of chicago or a taste of um you know dc i'm sure they have do they have a taste of dc they've got to yeah like food festivals yeah yeah it, it it's dare i say cheaper in epcot to do it that way than going to these tastes that i've been to in other cities if you could if you do it right you can get some serious bang for your buck and i think what you have to put in perspective is compare it to another um, snack, right? Yeah. At Disney World, a Dole Whip, the the quintessential uh, Disney World snack is close to six dollars. You know, so mm-hmm. if you're getting, you know, maybe a, from a certain stall, a hunk of steak, you know, and a side of potatoes or whatever, for around that price point as well, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, but then also the the smaller plate aspect lets you explore more options and, and try other booths um, as well. I think the main thing um, is not to be overwhelmed by the amount of, of stalls there are because you shouldn't feel like you're missing anything. You should just feel like I'm going to ex- go and explore and, and, and try some some nibbles, you know? Mm-hmm. It's not like, well, I have to ride Big Thunder Mountain or my vacation's going to be ruined. No one's saying, I have to get to the Brazil Pavilion, our food booth, or my vacation will be ruined. Listen, two things. One, when you show up, 
get one of those passports. They have passports in the front, and it's basically your guide to the festival. It lists every single kiosk and what they're offering food-wise. Then you can map it out, see what you want to eat. But also, I generally tend to do like two laps of the World Showcase. Ooh. And that's a, that's a lot of walking, but... It's a good tip, folks. I'll do a lap. I'll put something in the back of my mind because you'll be able to see how it's coming out when they're serving it. If people seem like they're enjoying it, I'll just keep that booth in my mind as I continue around. I might get something here, something there. And then on my second loop, I'm like, okay, remember that thing? I want to get that there. Connor, I think you and I talk a lot about adjusting on the fly going to Disney. And I don't think there is a possibly better instance where you need to know that you're going to have to adjust on the fly than the Food and Wine Festival. I think you really have to go in with A, an open calendar, and B, an open mind to really just let that day kind of take you. Like you're saying, you know, I'm going to be able to pass through twice. I'm not going to overbook my, you know, maybe I'm not going to overbook on fast passes that day. Uh, You know, Epcot's a great park to go to when it's not the 62 plus days of food and wine festival and make a dinner reservation but in this fact or a lunch reservation too but when food and wine's rolling around you're going to be able to get a lot of really good food at a good price and if you just want to keep your calendar and your day open you're going to be able to fill up and experience a lot of cool stuff if you're willing to adjust on the fly like you're saying my ambitions for food and wine are always more than what i come out with I always yep. go in like I have. I'm gonna try this because I'm a planner, so I go in yep. knowing which ones I want to try. I've read all the reviews. Like me, Hank and I have said time and time again, we're psychopaths. Um, so I, I always have like a list in my head, and by the time I finish, I'm full and I'm only halfway through my list. Right. Um, but it is a, a, a total on the fly thing. Maybe you're you're not hungry when you're at that booth. Ah, eh, whatever. I'll go to the next one. Maybe I'll be hungry there. Um, and you know, it's always hard now that you can book for be our guest, you can book your meal, like what you want to order, like 30 to 60 days in advance. You're like, okay, what do you want to eat 30 days from now? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what mood I'm going to be in. You know, it's hard to plan that, but when you're in the mood and you smell something and you're walking around and you've just had something, um, you just go for it. It's a total gut reaction. And this, is the, and this is the thing is like, you listen to, just listen to you talk right now, Connor, and you say, I'm a planner. I plan things out. And then I'm sure there's people that listen to this podcast or listen to other podcasts and they're like, go with the flow, have fun. And you're like, I can't do that. I'm a planner. Mm-hmm. And you go, well, listen, speaking from experience, we are over planners. Connor and I spent three hours yesterday trying to plan a two-day trip, <laughs> a two-day trip into the park. And you know what? We're still going to go with the flow. That's the thing is you got to you got to be willing to balance the two. Like you know, everyone will have that planner in the family, but when there's so much at your fingertips in Disney, and then multiply that for the food and wine festival, I mean, it's really going to rock your socks. I think planning is more even just preparing for what's going to happen sure you know like having an idea in mind and and that's always a good thing just be flexible with it um try and get as much as you want if you only want to try one thing just try one thing who cares there's a lot of other cool things to experience there as well like there you go probably the second biggest draw is the eat to the beat concert series so this takes place at the American Gardens Theater, which is in the uh, American Adventure Pavilion. And it's awesome because they bring in bands from all over and and some big time bands. I'll read off the list in a second. But they basically play three sets each night. Um, One around like 5.30, one around 6.45, one around like 8 o'clock. And the bands that come in, they play sets of like five to six songs like just solid sets it only lasts probably 30 minutes then they get off then the next people come in and it's just a way to it really livens up the uh, the park as well and it's cool to be around world showcase while this is going on because you can hear those artists playing yep. and um it's cool i'll read off the artists uh this year they have like a ton 
of artists like they've added more to it it's but, every it's every day i yeah. mean like i mean no limits every day you're gonna you're gonna be there when there's something when this when there's music playing going when this started i feel like it was a very heavy thursday friday saturday sunday absolutely nothing monday through wednesday kind of thing but absolutely. now it's like hank said it's every single week of the festival the festival by the way which ha- has dipped into august now runs august 30th to november the 12th that's long that is long well i mean it really frees up your calendar too now for people that are are traveling from outside of florida um it it makes a whole lot more sense and connor while you're pulling up the the bands too i think it you know to speak for locals too that it's you know if you've ever been on the fence it's like you know am i going to get my money's worth with this an annual pass yes of course especially if you're listening to this podcast but the thing that i look at with you know some of the greatest amount of jealousy is that ability for florida residents to buy an after 4 p.m epcot annual pass that's insane to me i that that is the coolest thing i don't know they might have taken that away but when it was there did they take that away it was so cool did you have one why would I have one? When you when you lived in Florida. Well, I guess you were a cast member. Gosh, Connor. <laughs> Boy, you're so stupid. You know that's that's the kind of attitude that I just can't handle. No, but um, with, with an, even with an annual pass, rolling into those parks and you get a concert. You know, like any given weekend, and the ability to try a different type of food, you can really experience it all. It's just something cool. Like, like the reason, you know, like we were saying, Disney does this is to bring in locals just as much as it is to bring in um, guests from elsewhere. You're probably not going to be planning your trip around some of these bands. You might. But, you know, local might come in to, to, to see one of these bands and then eat their way around Epcot as well. Um, and the bands are pretty cool. I'll read off a couple of them now, but it's, it's people like... Um, Vertical Horizon, Baja Men, Plain White Tees, Living Color, Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray's great. I've seen them a couple times. Um, Everclear, ooh, Air Supply, Smash Mouth is very good there. Henry, Henry new for this year, 98 Degrees. I was going to say, how dare you not mention the Lachey. 98 Degrees, 38 Special, Kenny G, Hanson. Hanson's mm. always a big one. Um, we rode a we rode a ride right behind them that one time we were in Disney. Yes, we got off the uh, Kilimanjaro safaris, and Hanson was getting on the Kilimanjaro safaris. How about that, people? How about that? Also, I highly recommend their they brew their own beer, um, and uh, they sell it at the American Adventure Pavilion, uh, kind of the the stand right next to the funnel cakes. I think it's called Fife and Drum, but. It's very tasty, and you have to buy it because of the name. The name <laughs> of the beer is Mmm Hops. Oh. Mm oh. Hops, undo, mm hops, undo now. But these are like the perfect um, bite size. Ooh, maybe that's why they do it. Bite size concerts for your bite size <sighs> culinary journey. Man, so many I don't bad know. Jokes. I don't have a <laughs> marketing job there but um and then another one of these uh pairings that you can do is um a, an eat to the beat dining package which is where you select one of the restaurants like the actual sit down restaurants at um epcot and you're able to secure your spot um to get priority seating at one of these concerts so you'll select the restaurant, the time you're going to eat there, and then they'll give you priority seating at um, one of the concerts, which is pretty cool. Yeah, you're basically paying for a concert seat. Yes, but then also keep in mind, you know, are you do you want to experience as many food booths as possible? Yeah. Then maybe you don't want to do a sit-down meal. That and that's day. exactly what we're talking about. I, I err on the side of going into Epcot on a food and wine festival day with, you know, as open a calendar as possible i would i would err on the side of don't make a dinner reservation yes i would agree with that completely um another tip we have is 
if you can, I would suggest going with a fairly larger group. Like four people and above, I think is great for this, because what you're able to do is you're able to try more things, right? Ooh, let's try this one and we'll all split it. And then you go to the next one. Let's try this one and you all all split it. Like one person buys at this one, the next person buys at the, the next one. You're just able to try more things um, and broaden your, your culinary uh, adventures at Epcot. A couple other things that they bring in for the festival are um, celebrity chefs. And it's always cool because these guys do a, um, typically they do like a seminar. So the festival center, which is located in um, Future World, is where you're able to go and really get a lay of the land, but they have a lot of cool stuff in there too. Um, it's in Future World East, and it opens from 9 a.m. to park closing, so you just basically hug the left side of Epcot, and then you'll end up at the Festival Center. They have great merchandise there themed for the festival. That's where you can buy um, the mini festival gift cards that you can put on your, like on your, on your, as a bracelet, basically. Mm -hmm. And this is cool because you basically load it up with a certain amount, and once you're out, you're out. Yeah. Um, limit limit yourself. Fant I believe we've said this before, but absolutely a great way to let you actually track how much you're spending at a food and wine festival. Uh, this is one of the things where you might want to not be so heavy on the scanning your magic band if you're staying at a resort, because while these things are you know fairly affordable, it is. Um, it can get pricey once you've gone to like four or five booths. Mm -hmm. But if you have these, and these are refillable um, gift cards, and like I was saying, they come on like a little bracelet you can put in your pocket or on your wrist. If you just go into the festival center, say, I want to put $50 on this. Once it's gone, it's gone. Then you've limited yourself. You've created a budget and you've stuck to that budget. <laughs> or you just pull out your credit card at the next place once it runs out. Yeah, Which hey, I, I've had that I'm, problem. I'm definitely going to be on the either bringing cash or um, doing the gift card this time around. Just like for like you said, because it's it makes money that much less of an object when you're just zoop, 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 flying through every one out there, just scanning that card or tapping that magic band. Oh yeah, but kind of you were yeah you were talking about the chefs that they bring in for this, and there's a pretty incredible, and they've had it for a long time. A, like a pretty all-star lineup of chefs that come down because they they do the live taping of the chew every year down there there's all these different um we're also going to talk about how there's the sunday brunch um that you can do with a chef but the list of chefs if you ever go on to like the disney parks website and take a look at like the bands that are playing versus the chefs that are there and my god it is a list you cannot read off every chef or else we'll we'll be here for two hours it's cool because you know they've had yeah it is is it is it is insane it's a ton it's a it's a ton. Um, pick out a few of your favorites though. I mean, I see some on like oh Morimoto, Ma Masahari uh, Morimoto. It's cool because over the last few years, um, you know, Disney has been pairing with a lot of celebrity chefs to open restaurants in mm -hmm. Disney World in Disney Springs, especially as well. So they get a lot of those people. So Art Smith of Art Smith's Homecoming, Masahari mm -hmm. Morimoto of. Um, the Voltaggio brothers used to go. They're not on there anymore, I'm seeing. So a lot of people from Top Chef, a lot of just yeah. Food Network celebrities. Tony Montano. Robert Irvine. Richard Blaise is new this year. Oh, he's He's good. a Top Chef. He's very good. But you know what I like about this, too, is that they also bring in Walt Disney World chefs as well. Mm -hmm. So they bring in chefs from some of your favorite um, uh, restaurants across property. And you can meet them. You can talk to them. And these typically happen, I feel like it is it is in the Festival Center. The Festival Center also has like a lot of book signings, um, wine bottle signings, signings for people who are, you know, what do you, what do you call it? a winemaker? A winemaker? A wine maker. A wino? Um, I don't know. But a lot of times these chefs might do like a like a cooking demonstration or they might just be interviewed but it's just cool to see them and and do like 
like a meet and greet um, a lot of the times. Um, in the Festival Center, too, they do have a couple seminars as well um, that you can sign up for. Um, we're thinking about doing one this year. Mm-hmm. And that this one's cool because, Hank, it's only like 30 minutes, right? Yeah, and this, just, and this is the other thing. There's so much going on. You're like, yeah, why not? Throw it yeah. on there. Yep, throw it on there. We'll see. We'll see if we do it. We're doing the wine pairing, so like yep. they give you a couple wines. They tell you what it's good with pairs with. It's one of those things where it does go back to um, edutainment, right? Education, <laughs> entertainment. Like you're having fun, you're drinking some good wine, but you're also learning about the properties involved with it. Like why this pairs well with this, why this pair pairs well with that. Um, and that's it's, the stuff that's really fun at Disney World when you get to go through and actually get a little bit more. Like that's why that's part one of the things that makes living with the land such an actually fun ride. Is yes. edutainment actually is fun? People still go on Spaceship Earth because there is that element of you know edutainment to it. People oh, yeah. do spend hundreds of dollars to go behind the seeds to learn more about plants because it's actually fun, you know. Um, like you're saying, it's it's fun to sign up for these things there and get a little bit more than just eating or you know drinking to drink. Yeah. So the seminars are typically you you pay extra for them, but the the seeing the celebrity chefs, it's first come first serve with seating, but you can just kind of hang around. You you don't need an extra ticket for that or anything. Mm-hmm. Um. Um. And some of those other seminars, like the the cooking demonstrations. It, it all depends. I think the, the best way to go about it is when you get there that day, pick up a times guide, and it will usually have, you know, who's there for the day, um, if they're signing anything, if they're doing any, any demonstrations, stuff like that. So um, it's pretty cool. Another cool thing about the Festival Center is they have a wine shop there. So if you were walking your way around um, World Showcase and you happen to s- try a certain wine that you really really liked or a certain spirit that you really really liked you can go there and you can see if they have them available in bottle size what they do is they send it to the front of the park if you buy it so you have to pick it up there before you leave great touch though great touch because you can't just be walking around with a bottle of wine in Epcot um but yeah it's a great touch it's a, it's a way to continue your culinary journey even when you go back home and, you know, and Connor, I think another thing to add in, too, to just, like, help paint the picture for people that maybe haven't been to a food and wine festival or haven't gone in 10 years or so, is we we talk about how there's so much going on. Um, we, we're listing off thing after thing. But there's something about Disney World. Um, you know, there is this gated entry behind a park ticket. Um, it is a very large park. It is not, for some, at least for me, I never feel, I've never felt overwhelmed by the crowds there whereas going to have been to the taste of cincinnati or the taste of chicago there are literal crush points like where i you can't move past this person that's standing next to you but the flow of everything in epcot it does make it feel like a much more premium experience and not not in like a conceited way but just in a flow of things is nice and you don't feel like you're you're going to be crushed waiting in line for 30 minutes to get that hot dog on a stick. Epcot is good because it does get crowded, but it's their pathways are very expansive. Yes. Um, because it's kind of that world world's fair kind of thing going on. Um, yeah. I will say, you know, Friday afternoon into evening and then Saturday and Sunday are definitely the busiest of times. You you tend to get a lot more locals coming in during mm-hmm. then, but um I mean, it's busy. It's it's popular, but I do agree with Hank. The, the crush points aren't. Um, yeah, it is not. How about this? Let me say this way: the most stressed <laughs> you feel in Disney World is probably Fantasyland by the strollers. Yes. Yeah. I never feel like that no. at Food and Wine. No, no, no. Lines can get long, but you know they they do a good job of expediting stuff and whatnot. Um, I know we mentioned it at the top of the show or of this segment. But I just want to go back to the celebrity chefs because the the big thing is the Sunday brunch with the chef. Mm-hmm. So you go in, um, they have a buffet um, breakfast for you, 
brunch, I guess. And then they do a Q and A and a culinary demonstration with with one of those celebrity chefs, and that's in the event center as well. Just something to keep in mind. Connor, what are your most anticipated global marketplaces? What do you look forward to the most, and what do you see this year that makes you the most excited? You know, I because think, I think that's we talked. About, we start at the. Sorry to cut you off. Mm. We start at the top. That's like the main attraction. So I just kind of wanted to come back to it and say, you know, what what's the stuff that you would tell people to be the most excited about, or you personally? So you know, I think um, Disney does a great job of um, bringing back old favorites while continuing to have new experiences as well. So that's always what I look forward to. I always like getting one thing I've had before that I really enjoyed, and then um, one thing that's brand new to the, um, the festival that year. For me, I really, really love, um, I love Greek food, and their Greek booth mm. is really, really good. It's well themed too. It just sits there all year long, and you always look at it and go, ah. "Yes, it, yes, exactly." Um, <laughs> so they have like this little chicken souvlaki thing that comes with you know feta cheese and 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 stuff like that, and it's it's really really good. Um, I also really like the um, anything at the um, Mexico one is very good. That's a, I, yes, that's a sh- gimme. That's a and, gimme. And these ones are good because it's like elevated compared to the quick service location right next to it. <laughs> yeah. It's it's presented a little nicer. Um, it states, so this it. one, the short rib tostada. Ooh, that one was good. I remember that. Mm-hmm. I also, like one of my favorite dishes I get every time is the steamed mussels with garlic butter from oh. New Zealand. Like that's like think about that though. You're in a theme park, and you're getting mussels. You know, just like a couple quick little mussels, and then you're gonna go to Canada, and you're gonna get a fillet of beef, and then you're gonna go to Morocco, and you're gonna get those um, hummus fries, which are so good. Those like fried blocks of hummus. <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. So I mean, you know, I look forward to to those ones I've always been to, but you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't tried the flavors from from fire one yet but Mm -hmm. i really think that That, a lot of that gets me super excited i think they had it last year but i don't think i indulged in it but like piggy wings roasted pork rings with korean barbecue sauce and sesame seeds like that sounds fantastic or the smoked corned beef um oh yeah so it seems more like it's like um like grilling it and stuff like that but um yeah, I always, I always try for that. Change it up, but then keep it keep it uh keep it fresh. Yeah, I will say on my end, I. It's hard to pick one. You get I, you get so excited about all the different food out there, and then there's so much new stuff. I definitely want to try the lobster roll this year. Oh yeah, big. That looks awesome. And I do enjoy, I think the craft drafts is a nice, ta- like, you know, a nice space to relax in. Um, and they, they typically def- do flights of beers, so you can get, like, all four beers that they're offering. Yeah. And they'll give it to you in, like, a little glass, but you'll be able to sample all of them. Yeah, for a fairly good price, too, if I'm not mistaken. Like, they don't, they charge you what a flight, like, normally would almost be anyways, and you don't feel like you're overpaying for the alcoholic beverage like you might overpay for a normal sized one. I will say Some, this about yeah. about the beers. If it's a beer you really 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 want to try, go for it. But if it's one you want to kind of you're up in the air about, I would just go back into the actual pavilions and get a big beer because mm. the beers that they have in the kiosks will be basically a serving glass and the prices on it i don't think are are good enough for for what they're giving you when it comes to the flights i think that's a good deal yeah um but i agree I definitely those ones the sampler ones you're paying for the ability to sample at those booths correct yes and i feel like when you order the wine there you get more wine compared to what you would get if you get 
like a, a beer at one of the kiosks. It is the Food and Wine Festival, Connor. That is true. Not the Food and Beer Festival. Coming yeah, in 2019. Food. Oh, we're going to have to add that in. What's another slow time of year? Burgers Dang. and beer. No, and then I actually, I got to add in too. So I, you know, you, like we said, go with a group. Mm-hmm. Go with a big group of people. I'm excited for people. I'll probably imbibe, but I'm excited for my wife specifically and... I don't know who else would. But anyways, the Shimmering Sips Mimosa Bar this year. Oh, yes. There is a mimosa bar. Yes. So, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Disney moms. Sad Disney moms. Sad Disney moms. <laughs> Sad Disney moms. We need this. Yeah. So I am excited for that because it's cool because they got a, a couple different mimosa types there. And That'll be able to. Uh, that'll be another sampler while we're out there, and for anyone else that goes out and wants to try something new. You know what's cool about these things is Disney actually has like a flavor a flavor lab. They they describe it. It's like a test kitchen where they mm-hmm. test all of these new stuffs, new stuff, and they're always experimenting with you know new foods, new flavors, but also new ways of presenting it. And if you go to a couple of these these kiosks around, you might see. An ingredient you've never heard of before or a presentation style you've never seen so it's always cool to experience those things as well it's just just as much about the presentation and the way it's prepared as it is about the food itself and disney does it does a great job like hank was saying like the mimosa bar like that's something new for disney and they're trying a, a new approach to these things i do have a couple quick tips for getting the most out of the food and wine festival the first one seems kind of funny but it's actually really helpful it's remember it's hot there just remember Mm -hmm. it's hot like if you go in with a game plan you're like "Ooh, i want this pasta dish and i want this soup and i want this um you know i don't know something else that's hot It, it can be very filling when you're there in the florida heat and you're downing like hot pasta and stuff like that so just keep that in mind. Yeah, that'll happen. Just, just so you're not um, upset once that comes around. Um, and then one final tip is if you're on the Disney dining plan, most of these little tastes count as a snack credit. Just make sure you go up and it has the dining plan icon right next to it, and you can use a snack credit on that. Additionally, if there's a few items you want to try... Um, you can exchange a quick service meal for three snacks. And you can do that anywhere, but here it really pays off. You just have to do it in one transaction. So you go up to a booth, you say, I'd like um, this, this, and this, but could you charge me for a quick service meal? They'll be like, yep, no problem. And they can handle that. So if you have extra snack credits or extra quick service uh, credits, that's a great tip to utilize and get the most out of the food and wine festival. But I think that's all I have. I think in a later episode, a little uh, teasing the audience here, we'll probably give our review of Absolutely this, year's, we will. this year's festival when we go down um, at the beginning of November. So kind of towards the end of it. But, you know, the great thing about this is they're always bringing back good ones. So when we review them, most likely they'll be back the next year. Um, yeah, Connor, we'll actually probably do a, um, we could potentially, we'll look into our live capabilities, live. but we'll definitely record yes. in uh, Disney World on our trip down there. Absolutely. Well, we hope you enjoyed our little um, Food and Wine 101 here. Uh, we hope you learned some good tips, and we hope you're excited for the festival. Maybe it piqued your interest, and you're looking into going now. Um, it's a great festival. It's, it's not to be missed. And we're excited to go down later this year. But that's going to do it for us this week. As always, thank you so very much for listening to the show. Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with someone you think might enjoy it. If you liked what you heard today, then you've been listening to the WDW Opinion Podcast. If, by chance, you didn't like what you heard, then you've been listening to Planet Money. For Hank, I'm Connor. We'll see you real soon.